So in chapter 9, we're going to look at DNA replication. Even though the title of this chapter says DNA replication and recombination, we're not going to cover the recombination. We will cover DNA replication, which you may recall is the process during cell division or uh, preceding a cell division in which the monad chromosomes become dyad chromosomes. So everything in chapter 9 has to do with that process, really digging down into the details of that process. When Watson and Crick described the structure of DNA, they immediately saw that there was already a, kind of an obvious idea for how replication could happen. Because on a double-stranded DNA molecule, if you pulled the two strands apart, you really had enough information looking at one strand to know what nucleotides you would need to join together to make the complementary strand. So keeping that in mind, there was, prior to 1958, there was already an idea the way replication could happen. And you probably know that replication occurs by a model called semi-conservative replication. And that did turn out to be, that is the model that's correct. Um, but prior to 1958, they proposed a couple other ideas. It's called the conservative model of replication and the dispersive model of replication. Of course, the semi-conservative model of replication says that you start off with, in this picture, DNA, which is shown all in blue, and that after one round of replication, the original double-stranded DNA DNA has been basically unzipped and each of the blue strands is now part of a new chromosome copy with a red strand which is the newly synthesized complementary strand. Um, in the conservative model, what the conservative model of replication would say is that the original DNA shown in blue is copied, but the original blue double-stranded DNA is remains the same, and then you end up with a new completely red double-stranded DNA copy. So perhaps these two blue strands are pulled apart and copied, but then the blue strands are allowed to return back together and the red strands stick to each other, and you get this completely new um, chromosome copy. The dispersive model is a little more confusing. Basically what it says is that during replication, parts of the new strand are hooked on to parts of the old strand, or the parental strand, and you get this mixture of old pieces and new pieces joined together where the new DNA is dispersed within segments of the old DNA. So that's called the dispersive model. Alright, so in 1958, Matthew Meselson and Frank Stahl published their evidence of the semi-conservative model of DNA replication in bacteria, and then it was later shown by another group to also be the same in eukaryotes. Um, but Meselson and Stahl did the famous experiment, which is um, there's a link here at the bottom of the page for this. And what I want you to do is, right now, you're going to mouse over the experimental, where it says the Meselson install experimental design, and click on that, and the, the lecture will stop, and you'll go out to an animation on the internet that you will explore and look through and listen to, um, and then return to your lecture when you're finished. All right, now that you are back at the lecture and you've watched the video or the animation on the experimental design of Meselson and Stahl looking at the heavy nitrogen and the lighter nitrogen and how they figured out um, which model was correct, we will review how this looks in bacteria and then in eukaryotes. So replication in bacterial chromosomes or plasmids starts at a single origin of replication. The two strands of DNA are pulled apart, and they're shown in gray. Then the new strands are built, shown in red, starting from the origin and moving in both directions away from the origin. This is called bidirectional replication. You'll also notice that both strands are being replicated at the same time. The replication fork is shown here at the top, it's the point at which the two strands of DNA 
are being pulled apart and so that the new strands can be built using them as template. So you have a replication fork here moving towards more or less the left from this replication bubble and you have a replication fork moving more or less towards the right. And so as this proceeds, you end up with, you recall, a shape that looks like the Greek letter theta. So this is called theta replication. And as it continues, eventually you'll get two copies of the original circular DNA molecule. So that could be a plasmid that's just been replicated or it could be the entire bacterial chromosome. Now in eukaryotes, semi-conservative replication is also, also is what occurs. However, you have more than one origin. So in this picture you have three origins spread out along a region of a chromosome. Origin 1 and origin 2 form a replication bubble first, then origin 3 a little bit later. Each of them has two forks, two replication forks that are moving away from the origin bi-directionally. And basically what's going to happen is, is as the DNA replication progresses, the replication fork from the first origin will crash into the other one from origin 2 and that section will be completed. So when all the replication bubbles merge together, you have the final product, which is the, double, uh, the two copies of the chromosome. I would put, just to keep in mind what this is, these two new copies of the chromosome are sister chromatids. So I'm drawing a centromere here to show you that this is two chromosomes connected by a centromere. So what we would call a replicated chromosome, which we've been drawing like this, this is what you're seeing here. So up here, when we started with one chromosome, this is an unreplicated chromosome that we might draw that way. So this is the process by which you get from an unreplicated chromosome to a replicated. All right. Now, zooming in a little bit closer so that we can see the actual nucleotides, you see that they're showing the template strand, the original strand of DNA in gray or yeah, in gray, and then the new strand that's being built is shown in red or pink. So what's happening is there's an enzyme called DNA polymerase. It looks at the base that's on the template strand and it's going to attach a complementary base to the new strand. So the DNA polymerase will look here. For example, you have at the next position, you have a G. So the DNA polymerase will pick up a C nucleotide. Now the nucleotide has three phosphate groups on it. It's actually a triphosphate version of a nucleotide. Two of the phosphates will be cut off and the remaining portion is what's going to be connected to the chain. So you have a three prime hydroxyl at the end of the chain the new nucleotide will be attached to that and so your 3' prime hydroxyl end will move down one nucleotide. <coughs> Excuse me. So we say that we've added a nucleotide to the 3' prime end of the new strand and the 3' prime end has moved down or grown by a length of one nucleotide. Then if we wanted to add another nucleotide, then the enzyme would look and see there's a C next. So it's going to need to add a G onto this side here. So it would add the G nucleotide here and then your free hydroxyl would be down here. And that would be your new three prime end. So every time you add a nucleotide, it's going to move the three prime end down. So we say that the direction of growth is in the direction of the three prime end. You have a leading strand and a lagging strand that will be associated with each replication fork. That's because 
Replication is happening on both strands at the same time. However, the fork is only opening in one direction. At least this fork is only opening towards the right in this picture. So on, on the bottom strand, the direction of DNA synthesis on the, new, on the red strand is from 5 to 3, so it's also moving to the right. But the direction of synthesis on the top strand is going to have to go towards the left because of the orientation of the, of the 5 and 3 prime um, directionality. So you have on the top strand, you have the direction of the new synthesis actually going opposite to which direction the fork is opening. So the bottom strand, the strand that is being synthesized in the same direction of the fork is called the leading strand. The strand that's being synthesized in the direction opposite of how the fork is unwinding is called the lagging strand. So here's another picture of the same thing, but now we've backed up a little bit so we can see more of the chromosome. At the top, you have sort of the early time point. So initially a primer is going to lay down and extend in, in the direction of the fork. That's the leading strand. On the top, a piece will be built in the opposite direction. That's the lagging strand. And then what's going to happen though as the replication fork unwinds more and more DNA is that once this section unwinds, you now have a new piece here on the top strand that needs to be replicated. You already replicated this piece, but now there's a new area that needs to be replicated. So then another replication will happen here, and it will crash into the first piece that was already there. So this piece was made first. This piece is made second. And then as that's happening, a little bit more of the template is unwinding. And so now you have to start again and make a new piece, which this will be the third piece that's made, and it'll crash into the second piece. So on the lagging strand, replication occurs in a discontinuous way, meaning lots of pieces, which eventually will have to be all joined together. Those fragments, those pieces, are called Okazaki fragments and they only are associated with the lagging strand or the discontinuous synthesis. So the requirements of DNA synthesis in bacteria are you have to have a DNA template, you have to have a supply of deoxynucleoside triphosphates, those are the uh, nucleotide precursors with the three phosphates on each, you have to have DNA polymerase, which is the enzyme, and then you need a primer, which is going to be built by an enzyme called primase. That's because DNA polymerase cannot add the first nucleotide to start building a new strand of DNA. It can only add nucleotides to the three prime end of a strand that's already started. So we're going to need this other enzyme primase to get things started. We have five types of polymerase in bacteria. They're called polymerase 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Really the ones we'll be talking about are polymerase 1 and polymerase 3. The other types are used for DNA repair. So my tip for you is to pause this slide and read through this table because what you need to learn in order to know the process of DNA replication, you need to know the name of each enzyme or protein involved, what function it serves, and the order in which they function. And actually this table shows them in order, more or less. Some of the proteins work really throughout the whole process, but this is a logical order to learn these enzymes or proteins um, in. Okay, so let's go through the very first couple steps. The first step is you have an origin, that's a certain sequence in the DNA. There's a protein called the initiator protein which binds to the origin and opens up a little bubble on the DNA. The unwinding then allows an enzyme called helicase to attach at this replication fork and at this replication fork, so two replication forks. Then also you're going to have shown with these purple little dots, these are the single-stranded binding proteins which 
pretty much coat both strands of template because it prevents the two strands from coming back together. Of course, remember, these two strands are complementary, so they will naturally be attracted to each other by the hydrogen bonding. So these single-stranded binding proteins will deflect or decrease the attraction of these two strands for each other. Now, ahead of the replication fork, there is going to be some very tight coiling of the DNA that's going to occur because as you're unwinding the DNA at the fork, that coiling tension is going to transfer ahead of the fork and start making knots in the DNA. And so you have an enzyme called gyrase, and I also used another name for it called topoisomerase, but in the book, in this book, we're going to call it by its more specific name, gyrase, which will actually slide ahead of the replication fork and make little snips as the DNA starts getting wound very tightly and release the um, tension of, of supercoiling or overwinding of the DNA. Okay, now we're actually ready to start building the new strands of DNA. So far, we've had four proteins in the process of getting ready for this, but now we're actually ready to build DNA. You have an enzyme called primase. Primase can lay down the first nucleotide to start the new strand, but primase can only build RNA. So primase will lay down a few nucleotides of RNA in a little chain, um, and then DNA polymerase 3 will then add on to the 3' prime end of that primer and then continue on building in with DNA shown in red. So in this picture, the RNA primer is shown in green, and then the extension on, in DNA is shown in red. Of course, in this picture, you have two replication forks, one more towards the left and one more towards the right. And you'll see that on each replication fork, one of the strands is called the leading strand. It's the one that's being built in the direction of the unwinding of the DNA at that fork. And the other strand is the lagging strand, in which case the DNA is being built in smaller pieces um, in a discontinuous way. So in this slide, we just highlight the two polymerases, the polymerase 1 and polymerase 3. Both of them um, can build DNA from 5' prime to 3', prime, so that's called 5' prime to 3' prime polymerization activity. Both of them have what's called 3 to 5' prime exonuclease activity, which is in the middle column of this chart. What that means is that the, um, prime, uh, the um, DNA polymerase, if it adds the wrong nucleotide to a chain, it can stop, back up one base, cut that wrong one off, add the right one, and then move forward. So because it's backing up, we say that the direction is reversed. So instead of 5 to 3, it's 3 to 5. And because it's backing up and cutting something off of the chain, it's called an exonuclease. An exonuclease is an enzyme that cuts nucleotides off the end of a strand. So the polymerase can only cut off the very last nucleotide that it added if it senses that it's the wrong one. It can replace it and then continue moving forward in the 5 to 3 direction. Also, on DNA polymerase 1, it states that it has 5 to 3 exonuclease activity, and that is the function of primer removal. So the 3 to 5 exonuclease activity is called proofreading. It's where it corrects any mistakes it makes. But the 5 to 3 exonuclease activity is the primer removal ability, and only polymerase 1 has that. So after DNA polymerase 3 extends from the primer, extends the new strands, and then DNA polymerase 1 comes back and replaces the RNA primers with DNA, you will have some places where there are certain phosphodiester bonds that need to be formed in order to connect all of the pieces into one continuous red strand of DNA or new strand of DNA. And that enzyme is called ligase. Ligase seals any remaining 5' prime phosphate to 3' prime hydroxyl phosphodiester bonds that still need to be um, made. 
Once that's done, you'll have a nice complete strand. Okay, so on this slide you see the chart, again, that you can review all the um, proteins and enzymes needed for replication in bacterial cells. But I ask you this question, why is it that you think that we don't find bacteria that have mutant alleles for any of these proteins? And by mutant alleles, what I really mean is non-functional alleles. What would happen to a bacterium if it couldn't make a good initiator protein, or if it couldn't make DNA helicase, or if it couldn't make DNA polymerase? If, if the mutant alleles prevented those proteins from doing their job, then what would happen is the bacteria would not be able to replicate. It would not be able to divide. Because if you can't replicate your chromosome, then you're stuck. You can't go through a cell division. So once that cell dies, that's it. That mutant allele is gone. So you typically won't find bacteria that have serious mutations in any of the genes that encode these proteins. However, you might find bacteria that have minor mutations in these genes. And what I mean by that is there could be a mutation that causes an allele that makes a protein that works, but maybe more slowly or maybe not as efficiently. Then you might get a bacteria that can replicate, but it might replicate slowly. It might be slow to grow a colony. So those things you might be able to find. But mutations that absolutely destroy these the ability to make any of these proteins would just not be something that would survive in nature. Now I know we've shown the um, how DNA is replicated as if you have DNA polymerase on the leading strand and another DNA polymerase on the lagging strand. And that's true However, what we have found is that the two molecules of DNA polymerase are actually attached to each other in a dimer, and that they both work on their own strands simultaneously. So you have the leading strand, the template passes through the active site of the polymerase enzyme straight through, but the lagging strand loops in an inverted way through the active site of the other polymerase. And so what that means is, I don't think, I'm not that concerned that you understand this in a lot of depth, but what I'm telling you is that both of these strands are actually synthesized at the same time from two enzymes that are attached to each other. So this is a video, um, if you click on this link, if you mouse over, and then you'll, it'll bring up a YouTube video and you can slide um, up to a minute 45 and watch how they show the, this cohesive model in 3D. It's, a, it's in computer animation, but it's pretty good. And I just want you to appreciate that it's not exactly the way it looks on paper, um, but this is more realistic of how DNA replication happens on both strands at the same time. So go ahead and mouse over and click on that and then come back to the lecture when you've watched that. So everything we've looked at so far is replication in bacterial cells, in prokaryotes. But in eukaryotes, replication is pretty similar, but there's a few things that are more complicated. First of all, in eukaryotes, each chromosome has lots of origins. And you may remember from the beginning of the lecture that not all of them necessarily start replication at the same time. So what has to happen is all the origins are marked with a protein. A protein is attached to the origins. It's called a licensing factor. And when the origin has a licensing factor, that marks it that it has not been replicate, has not initiated replication yet for that cell cycle. Once replication happens at that origin, the licensing factor will be gone. And so without a licensing factor, that means that that origin has already been replicated.
So that's how the cell can keep track of which origins have already started replication and which haven't. Um, because eukaryotic chromosomes have so many origins of replication, um, they could replicate um, they could initiate their replication simultaneously, which would mean that they could replicate their chromosomes as fast or even faster than a bacterial cell. However, they don't actually replicate all of their origins all at the same time. I can't explain why, but they don't, so it actually goes a lot slower than you would think. The DNA in eukaryotes is wrapped around histone proteins, and you remember the nucleosomes and so on. And so the DNA has to be unwound from the histones, replicated, and then rewound around new histones, which offers a whole complication of more enzymes that would be needed to achieve this. Um, and the fourth way that, that eukaryotic replication is more complex than bacterial replication is that you have not just five polymerases, but more than 15. So here's a list, and they're all shown um, here. There's an important message at the top. Don't memorize these. But the point is that you have more than just the five. And these are given Greek names, Greek letters, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, etc. And so um, whenever you see those Greek letters for naming a polymerase, that's a eukaryotic polymerase. Most of these, if you look at this list of functions, translesion DNA synthesis, a lesion is uh, like a, a damaged area. So you have a lot of repair and translesion synthesis, so those are basically all DNA repair. Um, only a few of them, like alpha, polymerase alpha is, acts as the primase, um, delta is the lagging strand polymerase. There's only a few that actually function for the main part of DNA replication. Most of them are uh, epsilon is leading strand. So most of them are just DNA repair. So. so eukaryotes have much bigger genomes and the polymerases I just showed you are, actually work much slower than bacterial polymerases, but a eukaryotic chromosome or a eukaryotic genome could replicate faster than a bacterial genome if all the origins activated at the same time. All right, the telomeres. Telomeres are very interesting. Replication of telomeres. Bacteria don't have telomeres, so they don't have a problem <laughs> replicating their telomeres. Telomere is the end of a linear chromosome. Eukaryotes have telomeres, and the problem with them is that the ends of the chromosome shorten. The, the telomeres shorten every time a chromosome replicates, so every cell cycle, because the primer that's removed from the end of the chain cannot be filled in with DNA nucleotides. There's a limitation on the DNA polymerase that normally would fill that in. It can't fill it in at the end of the chain. So what happens is the chromosome ends get shorter. For many somatic cells, this is a part of normal aging. The, the shortness of the telomeres actually is important because when the telomeres get to a certain shortness, it tells the cell it's time to die. Um, there's a scientist named Leonard Hayflick who discovered that most cells divide a pretty fixed number of times, then enter what's called senescence, which is really like a non-dividing stage that precedes death. So apoptosis usually happens after that. The number of cell divisions that a cell can perform is called the Hayflick limit. So depending on what kind of cell you're looking at, they'll have a certain range. It's not necessarily um, an exact number, but it'll be pretty close. Like if, if the Hayflick limit for a certain type of cell is 50, then most cells will be pretty close to 50 when they go into apoptosis. Now this is assuming nothing else causes them to die first. So the Hayflick limit for most cells is between 30 and 50 cell divisions before they die. Now, some cells though have a certain amount of immortality, and that is the result of an enzyme called telomerase. All of your cells have a gene for telomerase, but most of your cells don't express the gene. 
Okay, you remember when we did, for example, the bacterial transformation lab, we had some cells that got the GFP gene but didn't express the protein. Um, and so some cells will have, all cells will have the gene for telomerase, but they won't all make the enzyme. What telomerase does is it extends the telomeres. When the telomeres shorten because of the cell division, then this enzyme will come in and extend them. But most somatic cells don't make the telomerase enzyme. So eventually they reach their hayflick limit and they die. However, a small group of cells has telomerase. Those would be your germ cells and your white blood cells. So they can keep dividing and keep dividing past the normal Hayflick limit. They are not truly immortal, meaning they still have a limit. It's usually about 200 or something like that, but it's much past the normal Hayflick limit. Another type of cell that has active telomerase enzyme are cancer cells, and that gives cancer cells a certain immortality. So what some scientists are working on is really an inhibitor of telomerase because that could be a good cancer drug. That is the end of our lecture.